Well, good evening. Happy Shabbat to one and all. Welcome to Yada Yada Radio. I'm here with uh, Kirk and uh, and D. And guys, before the show, we were commenting on the uh, the Darwin Award. Um, there was an initial report out of uh, of Gaza uh, that in a U.S. Yeah. aid drop by parachute into Gaza, uh, five uh, fake Estonians were killed. Uh, that, that's like it's like an ostrich dying of of uh, of drowning by putting its head up in the air and drinking too much rainwater. Uh, see the nice parachute coming down. I'll catch it. No, you, Ahmad. No, Muhammad, you catch it. Oh, how many? How many Gazans does it take to catch an airdrop of food? Uh, of course, the Defense Department of the United States says, no, no, we didn't kill anybody. But uh, I recall uh, doing a, a thorough investigation, in fact, I wrote a book on it, of the um, first 500 U.S. military casualties uh, in the Afghan and Iraqi wars. And I looked up and read in great detail um, about how each of the first 500 American servicemen and women died and what the Department of Defense reported regarding their deaths. And 100% of the time, without exception, the U.S. Department of Defense lied. Mm. And they did so because they were didn't want to come across as completely inept. They did so because they wanted to uh, to justify an unjustifiable war. So I can't tell you who is lying here in Islam. Uh, lying is lawful and good. Uh, Muhammad urged his followers to lie to deceive non-Muslims. And you've got yes. a Department of Defense that would rather lie than tell the truth, even if the truth sounded better. Uh, but just think of the stupidity of this whole thing. I was listening to a, uh, um, a very erudite, well-informed, articulate Israeli uh, government official. Speaking of uh, the 150 uh, truckloads of uh, food that is being delivered into Gaza every day and has been delivered to Gaza every day for month after month after month. And he said, would you like to compare that to how much food was brought into Gaza uh, before um, Muslims so viciously mutilated and attacked and murdered and abducted Jews? So. There's 150 truckloads of food arriving in Gaza every day. Before the war, how many do you think arrived? Well, we know, so go ahead. 100. Wow. So there's 50% more food arriving in Gaza per day than arrived in Gaza when, well, there were 800 millionaires in Gaza because, well, the United States, the European Union, the Qataris et al., are so generous to terrorists who butcher Jews. They, the conditions in Gaza, according to the IDF soldiers who have published their personal experiences, are nicer than the conditions in Tel Aviv. And they ate fabulously on 100 truckloads of food a day. Of course, they don't grow anything because Muslims don't work at anything but killing Jews. So 100 truckloads a day was no problem. 150, oh, they're starving to death, those damned Israelis. And, of course, Biden wow. won't even talk to uh, Netanyahu now because the senile Biden is upset that Israelis shot some Tinians standing in food lines, and, and, and that's, that's just not acceptable. Well, the IDF just finished its investigation. Didn't shoot anybody standing in food line. Not, mm. not 100, not 20, not 5, not 1, 0. All of the deaths that ensued as a result of the mob scene a week ago in Gaza with the direct result of the fake Estonians mobbing the trucks. Matter of fact, there are truck drivers who came back and showed their trucks totally destroyed and that they thought that the Muslims were going to kill them and say they'll never go back in. 
and they're warning any other driver, you ought not go back in. These people are savages. Now, the only people that Israel shot were those Muslims that weren't in the food line, that weren't around the trucks, that decided they would use this opportunity to go and see if they could score some jihad points and mark their ticket for martyrdom and kill Jews. And they rushed the the IDF troops. And the IDF troops were only there to keep Hamas away because normally the reason that the food doesn't get to the fake Palestinians is because Hamas steals it. And yet the United Nations bellyache, humanitarian crisis, President of the United States bellyache, humanitarian crisis, vice president who has an IQ of about the same level as the uh, the Gazians, which is sub-70. You know, I figured, as I write Prophet of Doom, the, uh, rewrite it as goddamn religion, I'd have to shed two Gazians to be at their uh, same level. My IQ is actually three Gazians. <laughs> I don't think it's cumulative <laughs> that way. <laughs> I actually think it would take 10 million Gazans to outthink me. Nonetheless, my IQ is actually three times the Gazian average IQ. So I, clearly I'm not writing for them. No. Um, it is just pathetic what is uh, happening. And now the United States is announcing that we're going to send U.S. troops into Gaza for this humanitarian crisis that doesn't actually exist. What are they going to do there? Are they going to shoot the IDF? Sure as hell, they can't shoot fake Estenians. No. What if they shoot fake Estenians? Then what happens? Are they going to sanction themselves? Are they going to report themselves to <laughs> the international court? What in the hell do they expect is going to happen? They expect these fake Estenians that they're so concerned about that they say, oh, there's no correlation between the fake Estenians and Hamas. Do they expect that they're going to say, lay rose petals at their feet, give them kisses when they come in? Thank them for uh, for being there to to save them from what? <laughs> the IDF, who's the only one that's actually protecting them? The, God, the mm-hmm. Hamas would just as soon, the more that die, the better. I mean, what in the world could go wrong with the U.S. <laughs> sending troops? And then the next thing they want to do is they want to build a, a new harbor for uh, for Gaza. But then they decided, we really don't have the wherewithal to build it. So the smart people are in Israel. They want Israel to go build a harbor for Gaza for the very people that maimed and mutilated them. And and American Jews are commenting and said, well, it's been a one-way street. It's time that the Jews do something to repay America for its support. Oh, please. I beg I tell you what pardon. we need to do. I tell you what we need to do is not uh, uh, tonight, maybe next week. We need to go back to Yashaya, Isaiah 17 and 18. And read about why the why the great prophet had so much derogatory to say about the United States and what's going to happen to the United States. And he predicted, and I translated this 20 some odd years ago, that the United States would pay a catastrophic price for its uh, on uh, on Israel. And we had no idea at the time how that would happen, although. We sort of guessed that Saudi Arabia and oil would push America into this place and anti-Semitism and and Mm -hmm. somehow uh, uh, politics and the like. But with the Biden administration, we are seeing Yashaya 17 and 18 materialize before our eyes. But fortunately, fortunately, Biden has the answer. He was heard this week, I think it was today. Uh, on a hot mic, saying that that the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, is going to have his come to Jesus meeting with him. Oh my God! My You're God. kidding me! I mean, can you imagine <laughs> for him to say something more out of touch with what's appropriate? Come to Jesus meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister, and he's a wow. frigging Roman Catholic. It's going to happen. Oh Come to Jesus' meeting with it. <laughs> you know, oh. America, if you're a patriotic American, I, I'm just sorry, but you, you're a nincompoop. 
<laughs> if you're yeah. a Muslim, you are really a nincompoop. If you're a progressive, well, you're not listening to this program because you're way too dumb to uh, to process <laughs> anything we have to uh, to say. There was a fake Estadian, by the way, anti-Israeli. They call them activists. Let's just call them uh, Muslims, who uh, decided that she would spray red paint on a uh, portrait of uh, of uh, Balfour. The uh, you know mm-hmm. he was the one that uh, that because of of what Chaim Weizmann had done to save uh, the United Kingdom against mm-hmm. uh, the Germans in the First World War, that was told he would get. Uh, um, uh, Israel and Israel at the time was going to include almost all of Jordan so it was almost all of Jordan yep. plus Israel the British owned it all controlled it all because well they had uh, bribed the Assad warlords Wahhabis uh, to fight against the Ottoman Turks and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and ended up because they the Sauds were you know riding horses and camels and wielding scimitars uh, whoop the Ottoman Turks in that part of the region. The uh, the, the Brits claimed it, and uh, and so it was theirs to give. And Chaim Weizmann uh, had saved the British Empire. They awarded him Israel and, and Jordan, and then the Muslims had a conniption fit and uh, reneged on the uh, the deal. And so uh, the Holocaust happened as a direct result of that. Uh, and so this woman thinks it's appropriate for her to do that. I'm sure because she thinks that there was a fakistan before uh, uh, all of this occurred. <laughs> now, Probably. at the same time, uh, in, uh, in uh, Niger and Nairobi and, uh, and uh, other uh, central Islamic countries, Boko Haram, they don't even refer to Boko Haram by name anymore or the fact that it's an uh, Islamic terrorist group is continuing to ca- kidnap uh, Christian girls to the tune of two to three hundred a day. And mm-hmm. they have a special word in Islam for a, a captured female uh, that says that she is a sex slave. When they were uh, the United Nations workers, teachers uh, that worked for uh, the United Nations uh, in, uh, in the Gaza Strip, participated in the invasion, there were 14 that were actually gunmen in the invasion who raped and plundered and abducted Jews. And, of course, I think it was 1,400 of them that uh, celebrated it on their social media sites that actually were paid by the United Nations. And one of them said, was writing a letter back home, I've got myself a Jewish sex slave. Uh. Yep. <sighs> But uh, that's happening with reckless abandon in uh, in Central Africa. That report came out uh, today um, on the number of female genital mutilation survivors. Uh, this is a function of Islam. They don't want to ever associate with Islam, so they say that it comes from many countries. Well, 98% of it is Muslim. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, do you know why uh, Muslim mothers, and it's Muslim mothers, uh, mutilate yeah. their daughters. Sure. You know why they do it? So they sexually them, mutilate their daughters so that uh, they'll sew up a part of the vagina and they'll cut off their clitoris. Why Why do they do that? So they gain no joy? For money. They do no, it for really? money. Because really? daughters in Islam are property to be sold to the highest bidder. And a a Muslim parent that can prove that their daughter is a virgin because, well, she would never enjoy sex and because she's had her vagina partially stitched up uh, fetches a higher price. So when somebody cries out and says, those, those poor Muslim women and children in Gaza, they're starving, this is what they do to their own daughters. Perhaps I don't care. And perhaps you shouldn't care either. $230 million. Where's the outcry? Where's the international court? We're not talking about some inflated number of, of Gazans. Let's say that the number that uh, 
Gazians that have been killed is in the range of 20,000, uh, with uh, 15 to 18,000 of them being uh, Mujahid. By the way, you know, Mujahid, you hear the term all the time, it means a Muslim militant. Do you know what it is? Mujahid, jihad. Yeah, it, is a, yeah. it, is, it is a jihadist. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I wanted to share in the, in the news today. Uh, the United States is, uh, is continuing to be the Trojan horse that I predicted they would be uh, towards uh, Israel. Uh, this administration is as lost, as immoral, as disgusting as, well, come to Jesus would, uh, would have it to be. Uh, I am... I'm just disgusted by uh, the uh, the whole uh, thing. All the while, we do have another country, by the way, that is um, is uh, in the running for most stupid country in the world. That would be France. Uh, uh, Marcion is definitely taunting um, Russia into world war. He says, you know, we're we're thinking about putting uh, troops in. Uh, and the Ukraine, because Ukraine is losing badly. And by the way, when was the last time that French troops fought a battle and won? Excuse me. Oh. I mean, uh, you, you, it certainly wasn't Waterloo, but it, you can go back maybe that far. I mean, they, I remember they went on all these places in Africa, and then I said this uh-huh. is going to turn out to be a disaster, licking their wounds. They finally yeah. with, with, uh, withdrew. They didn't win any battles uh, there. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know that what happened in the Second World War, it took the Germans about 15 minutes to kill and, uh, and put in prison about uh, 400,000 uh, French troops. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might have taken more than 15 minutes, maybe 16 or 17. Uh, yeah. When was the last time they fought a, a, a battle and won? Maybe the answer to end the Ukraine war is to send French troops. <laughs> that is funny. So here, here we are. What a what a crazy what a crazy insane world we uh, we live in. All right, I'm going to return to read the closing line of the uh, of the second to Mismore. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it's at least uh, uh, four Gazians in terms of uh, intelligence. I I poke fun at the Gazians because well the last time their IQ was tested. It was tested sub-70. A 70, I mean, Islam is the dumbest religion in human history. You have to be stupid to be a Muslim. And the fact is that that, uh, the dumbest of the Muslims are the fake Estenians. They have an average IQ, sub-70. Average is 100. And uh, full mental retardation uh, is uh, uh, anything below 70. Uh, So that's what we're we're dealing with. And... uh, in Gaza. That's why I just love it when the BBC and others uh, report the number of uh, fatalities in, uh, in Gaza, claiming this is the number of women and children and civilians that are dead. And they report the numbers that are uh, given by the Hamas uh, Health uh, or, uh, Office, which is nothing but a marketing arm, propagandist arm of a terrorist organization. Out of the way, the BBC, you are really on top of your journalism. <sighs> All right, so this is uh, Mismore, Psalm uh, 212. Uh, as we uh, proceed with it, then we'll read a recap of it. Um, the first and second Mismore fundamentally change the way we should look at history, the way we should look at life, the way we should look at God, the way we should look at the Messiah uh, and King, the way we should look at time. Uh, they are almost never discussed and yet they put everything into focus for us. Uh, if, for example, you just want to be out of this mess of Muslims acting badly and, and uh, Christians acting badly and progressives uh, acting badly uh, and, and have meaning in your life, purpose in your life, joy in your life, then my strong suggestion would be that you would turn to Dode, who is the author of this uh, Mismore. He is uh, quite easily the, the most brilliant uh, man who ever lived, a uh, stunningly uh, articulate lyricist and orator. Um, his mind was inquisitive. He understood the Torah probably better than anyone, maybe other than uh, Moshe, 
but uh, he, the, the relationship between the two is so profound because uh, Moshe delivered the Torah and Dod lived the Torah. Uh, mm-hmm. Moshe explained the Mikre, introduced them to us, and Dod fulfilled them. Uh, so they are the two Zoroa that matter in our story. Uh, and uh, when it comes to a program like this, because we commenced our work on behalf of Yahweh and his people on Teruah. Uh, Teruah means to herald a message. Um, and the message that we are heralding is about Dode's return and his desire for Yisrael and Yahuda, uh, Jews and Israel, to leave politics and religion behind, uh, disassociate from those things, and return to Yahweh prior to his return on Yom Kippurim in year 6000 Yah, uh, which is less than 10 years away. It'll happen at sundown, October 2nd, 2033. And so it is our life's mission to awaken Yisrael and Yahuda to the realization that Dod is your Messiah. He is your returning king. He is our savior. He is our shepherd. He is the Son of God. God said all of these things about him. It is He was articulate and concise in saying them. He didn't say it of anyone else, all of these things combined. And until you have an appreciation of who he is and what he has done, there's no uh, reconciliation with God. So that puts a lot of pressure on us to make certain we have this right and are telling it to you as God intended. Reach out and touch. Contacting is a sign of affection. Demonstrating your mutual adoration for the relationship with your radiant and favorite son. The brilliant and purifying air, lest he becomes indignant and displeased. And you perish in this manner. For indeed... His righteous indignation can be kindled for a few and for very little comparatively. Joyful with me and blessed by me, Ashery, are all who put their trust in him. Now, this statement, apart from the... Um, fulfill, did I just close the... I uh, the, uh, hope I didn't just do that. I think I may have just inadvertently closed the studio. I hope uh, that's not what uh, happened here. You can still hear me? I can still hear you. Okay. Yeah. Hear you. All right. Okay, let me uh, bring it back up uh, so that we uh, we have it. But it, it's the only way what we're reading here, uh, the only way that it that it makes sense that a man could say this, that reach out and, and as a sign of affection and your adoration for this relationship and touch the favorite sun, the brilliant and purifying air, or you're going to perish, is for Dode to be our Savior. That's yes. it. There is no other way that these words make sense. And the only way that Dode can be the Savior of Yisrael and Yahudim, and as well as the Goyim who, who uh, approach Yahweh by, uh, mm-hmm. by name and by covenant and by Mikre invitation, is uh, through him. So since the Mikre are the lone means to be part of God's family, to become immortal, become perfected, to be adopted, to be enriched uh, and empowered by God. What this means is that Dode had to fulfill them. Otherwise, there is no way that he could say, come to reach out and touch me, uh, approach me, be very close to me, uh, appreciating this mutual relationship with the favorite son. Bakurim means firstborn son. That's the purpose of Pesach and Matzah. It leads to Bakurim. Or you're going to perish. 
I'm all ears if somebody has another explanation for this. And since that explanation happens to be reinforced throughout the Torah and Prophets, you know, I'm going to go with it. I, you've got something else. You know, welcome to it. And then there has to be another element to it. Well, that's profound in itself. That would be, I think, the realization that Dode David, who is the Messiah, he is the Son of God by God's own admission on both, and he is the returning king and shepherd. That To acknowledge that and that he is the only one with all of those titles is almost enough for any one lifetime to be transformative. But then to recognize that Dode fulfilled Pesach, Matzah, and Bakudim, and is the first beneficiary of Shabuah, in your 4,000 Yah, 33 CE, is easily the most profoundly important discovery in the last 3,000 years. Yes, Agreed. for sure. And then to recognize that and say, now let me explain to you why Yahweh would say that his righteous indignation can be kindled for a few and for very little. Why would he say that? Well, the answer is obvious. Dode provided copious confessions, admissions, prophecies that he was going to fulfill Pesach, Matzah, and Bakotam. He explained why he was going to do so. He explained exactly how it was going to transpire. A tremendous pain to him. And then he did it. He allowed the Romans, the worst, most savage regime in human history, to torture him, his body. And then his soul carried our guilt into Sheol to deposit it there so that we would appear perfect in God's eyes. Two greatest sacrifices in human history. He made them both. And his people rejected him. And his people foisted a false messiah within a hundred years of this occurring and created a religion of Judaism that mocks him, that says God can't have a son, that says that there's an unknown Messiah coming, not Dode, that besmirches Dode, that never once speaks of Dode fulfilling these things and won't even say Yahweh's name. And then applied a goddamn star of Bar Kokhba to him, Mm -hmm. screwed around with him and said, this is the star of David. Talk about pissing him off. Yeah. This is your savior. (laughs) This is your king. This is your shepherd. And you do this to him? The very Messiah, the Herodim, say they can't lift a finger until he returns, who, by the way, will destroy them upon his arrival. Won't even acknowledge his name. Do you think that he has a reason to be upset? Mm -hmm. Forget the fact that Christians created a false Messiah in Jesus Christ. And a false son of God. And had the mythical misnomer be the stand-in for not even mentioning Pesach, Matzah, and Bakurim. But have it occur on those days. And to have... Three billion people believe that nonsense today. Yeah, that would be enough to irritate somebody that had endured this. Yeah, but that's chump change compared to his own people and what they have done. Yeah. That's why he's irritated. And he has a right to be. And I don't blame him. And I'm irritated for him. And by yeah. the way, an irritated dode... That's a bad, bad thing. For sure. Man fought 66 (laughs) battles. He didn't lose one. 
the biggest foe the last he ever you see. fought. Yeah, the ba- last battle, or the first battle he ever fought was a foul-mouthed Philistine. And he just went up and tongue-lashed it. He says, you're just a piece of crap, pal. Here, besmirch <laughs> Yahweh, besmirch Yisrael, and you're nothing but a foul-mouthed, uncircumcised Philistine. You brought your sword. You brought your javelin. Oh, man, you're all jacked up. Get it on. I brought, you, I brought you Iowa. <laughs> You're toast. <laughs> but the good news is, for the fake Estenians, Goliath was the first to form the prostration. He did a nose plant right there. So he was a good Muslim, I guess. All right, you guys didn't even appreciate that. First to perform the prostration was yeah, I don't know if you know that. When Dode, if you have to explain the joke, it's not any good anymore. When Doe threw the stone, <laughs> Goliath fell flat on his nose. He did yeah. a face plant. He was the first to perform the Islamic prostration. That was, good, yeah. <laughs> that was him, a good one. I caught it. Making him a Muslim. But if you have to explain it, I guess yeah. it's uh, not so good. All right. So <laughs> it, 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 it ends with uh, my favorite word, which is uh, Asher. This is Ashery. Uh, so it uh, it has the suffix of ani at the end of it, which makes it uh, me. Asher means to be blessed, uh, to uh, uh, to be shown the way, to uh, to live the fullest and most joyful life, to receive the blessings of the relationship. It's the most um, um, I think it's the most comprehensive word in the Hebrew lexicon because there's not a lot of words that can be a, a verb. It's a proper name. It's one of the uh, the sons of, uh, of Jacob. Uh, it's a noun. Uh, it is uh, a preposition. Uh, it, uh, it it's even a pronoun, reflects a pronoun. Um, I don't think there's any other word that plays as many roles in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms as Asher. Asher, one of the roles of Asher is I wouldn't be here today, and therefore this program wouldn't exist today. There wouldn't be 30 books on the shelf at uh, yadayah.com. By the way, just as a shout out to the yadayah.com team and that uh, David is the person who has done all the uh, underlying programming and, and I think he's done just a marvelous job. That site is absolutely mm-hmm. beautiful. It's so user-friendly. But there are yep. uh, there are three things on that site now that uh, I use uh, daily. Um, one of them is the... Uh, is, uh, uh, the search tool, which if you're looking for uh, for anything to is a particular subject and you need to look it up and find where it's been spoken of, that search tool works beautifully. I mean, yeah, it doesn't awesome. bring up anything that doesn't belong. It's so much better than Google. <laughs> as a it search is. Tool. It's, <laughs> it's really good. Here, here. Yeah, it's uh, so good. I mean, he it's you know that. At Google, of course, they pri- and, and Amazon, if you search for things, they always prioritize those who are bribing them uh, as opposed to what your search is <laughs> looking for. And so, I don't know, maybe it's Yahweh that's, uh, that's bribing uh, yeah, David because everything is just exactly <laughs> as Yahweh would want. So, uh, uh, anyway, it is, it's really marvelous. The other one is the index. The index takes you to every passage in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms that over the last 22 to 23 years – that I have translated, either an amplified or uh, summary portion. And and so um, when I'm looking for something, I uh, you can go right there and read it. And it is that's such a marvelous tool. And the other one is the timeline, yeah. which uh, uh, is a product of uh, Dee working with uh, with Jackie. And it is a it is also mm-hmm. a marvelous uh, tool. So these are all really good things, and I'm proud of them. And the only thing that <clears throat> that that uh, I'm looking forward to doing expeditiously on the site is, well, I think in the company has value uh, because uh, somebody Googles my name, they're going to read uh, a bunch of uh, garbage that was uh, written about me by people who don't even know me. And mm-hmm. I think to get the uh, the perspective of those who were actually in the business that they wrote about is uh, is exceedingly helpful and they're, uh, uh, therefore in the company is uh, it's not only an enjoyable read. It's uh, it's written like Moby Dick with a first person narrator. Uh, it's uh, done with uh, uh, with dialogue, 
uh, takes you right to the scene of taking a company public and the and what it's like to be part of a uh, of, of living in corporate America and building a business as an entrepreneur. So I think it has value from that point of view. Uh, but uh, what I'm looking forward to is getting uh, Profit of Doom uh, uh, delisted. Uh, I have now written uh, through about page 650-something and uh, of uh, Goddamn Religion 3, which is the rewrite of Prophet of Doom. Uh, the first two volumes are now published, both at about 800 pages and uh, in length. So we're up up into the 2200-page uh, realm. And so what I'm looking forward to is even from the prophetofdoom.net site, removing Prophet of Doom and replacing it with Goddamn Religion. Uh, Goddamn Religion is a thousand times better than uh, than Prophet of Doom. And so, and for those of you who uh, who haven't had the opportunity to read it, or uh, just choose that you know you, you want to spend all your time in the uh, Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, it really is an important read. And I will guarantee you that while there are parts that are really disgusting because Islam is is exceedingly brutal, uh, there is so much humor in it. I, I have I've done my best to keep pace with uh, Elia, my uh, my hero. <laughs> and so I think that if you read it, you will be entertained. There's places, too, where you're just going to die uh, laughing. So uh, we do try to make it as tolerable as possible. Anyway, this ends with joyful with me and blessed by me, Ashri, are all who put their trust in him. Uh, and so this, this is, is Yahweh and Dode speaking uh, together about the importance of what father and son did to fulfill the Moed Mikre so that we might become immortal uh, through Pesach. We might be perfected through what Doe did on Matzah and that we might be adopted into Yahweh's covenant family uh, and be among the firstborn children on Bakurim so that on Shabuah, uh, Yahweh can, and the set-apart spirit, can enrich and empower, enlighten and emancipate us to live fulfilling and productive lives. Of course, the next Moed Mikre is what this mission is all about, Teruah, uh, heralding Dode's return, uh, sharing Yahweh's covenant message, explaining what Yahweh is offering and expecting in return, and more important than anything else, explaining that God has a name, and that name is Yahweh. And until you start using it and sharing it and loving it to engage in a relationship, with him. Uh, the other portion of Teruah is consistent with everything that God has to say. God hates religion. He hates politics. And so it is a, a warning where Teruah is a, a warning to those who are interested in knowing God that the first step along that way is to do what Abraham did, to do what Moshe did, which is to walk away from religion and politics. There are no religious or political people in heaven. They, uh, while not all of them are in hell, almost all who are in hell have been overtly political or religious. So Dode is not being subtle here. He, it is by relying on what he has done that we are blessed. He knows it. We should know it. And it is in denying his role in fulfilling the Mikre. Mikre is an invitation to be called out and to meet. Uh, it's based on the verb kara, to summon, to invite, to welcome, to greet, to read, and recite, to proclaim, and to announce by name. Uh, all the M-I adds to as a prefix to kara uh, is, and the A ending it just makes it plural, is to ponder the implications of. <clears throat> it is an interrogatory, like so many interrogatories that uh, precede important uh, Hebrew words to encourage us to contemplate uh, the meaning of them. So in this particular case, uh, denying his role in fulfilling the Mikre became the essence of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that all such souls die apart from God. Well, except the best Muslims, the best Christians, and the most uh, outspoken uh, and best practitioners of Judaism, their souls will never die, but they will spend an eternity in Sheol. Mm -hmm. 
The Messiah, Dode, made the ultimate sacrifice. And for having done so, he has earned and he deserves our respect. Mm -hmm. He saved everyone who answers the Mikra. Yes. And, uh, and whoever accepts the terms and conditions of the Bereth. And Father and Son did this together. Those who benefit from both not only recognize and appreciate what he has achieved, but also they come to love Dode the son, as they do his father. And we picture ourselves and his place. We're invited into his place. That's what he accomplished by fulfilling Pesach, Matz, and Bakurim. When we put this in perspective, we see Dod having volunteered to accomplish the most magnanimous and courageous act in all history announcing it through the lyrics of his Mizmor Psalms. And by contrast, we find his people, Jews, as a result of their rabbis, denying everything he said and did. Almost as troubling, we find Gentiles creating the world's most popular religion by corrupting and contravening the Messiah's accolades and his accomplishments. This juxtaposition of right and wrong of beneficial and counterproductive, of truth and deception, of relationship and religion has never been so extreme. Therefore, the Father and Son have drawn a line in the sand. So the distinction between life and death is predicated on our position regarding Dode. Well. That's why well, listen, what we are doing is so important. There were so many years where I was so happy being anonymous. I was Yada, translating away to the best of my ability. I'd written you know, eight, ten books. I'd done a bunch of radio shows. I was very happy sharing with the world Yahweh's name, uh, the actual purpose and timing of the Moed Mikre as they had been fulfilled and would be fulfilled and giving a timeline for, for God's return and explaining what God was offering and wanting in return and, and felt, how could you live a more fulfilling life than that? What a, what a mm -hmm. wonderful way to spend one's time. And then we began to, uh, to translate things like I wanted to tell the story of of uh, what the Zoroa actually was, and I ran into places and and retranslating uh, Samuel, where Zoroa was mentioned, and it was about doubt. And yet the Torah describes Zoroa as the sacrificial lamb. That it's, it's the Passover lamb is the Zoroah. That's why the rabbis put a Zoroah on the plate at Passover. The Zoroah is the Passover lamb. But if you read, for example, the 89th Mizmor, Dode is called the Zoroah multiple times. Well, how can he be the Zoroah unless he's the Passover lamb? Yeah. But how can he be the Passover lamb unless he fulfilled Passover? When God mm -hmm. said that to Abraham, don't sacrifice your beloved son, your only son who you love. I will provide mm -hmm. the lamb. Who do you think he was talking about? Because no there's one only else. one person. He says, he is my son. I am his father. There's only one man who wrote in first person about the fulfillment of Pesach, Matzah, and Bakurim. And so trying to understand this word, I looked up every single use, and one of the uses is in the introduction to Yeshaya 53, which speaks of that lamb and the role that lamb plays in accepting our guilt so that we can be perfect in our Father's eyes. And so, so now what you're dealing with is a realization that he is the Zoroah. It's Dode. And then trying to make sense of Yashaya 9, the 
child who is born, the son who is given. He's the great Gabor. And you're reading this, and you're saying, wait a minute, there's only one man who was God's Gabor. Yeah. So, and there's only one name mentioned in Yahshua 9, pursuant to the prophecy. Don't. Well, that's being true, then you know, go back to the first passage that I translated 23 years ago, which is in Second Samuel 7, which is all about building homes and families. And Yahweh says, you know, it's my job to build your home, not your job to build my home. And in there he says, I am your father, you are my son, speaks of his son returning as king. And now you know that it, there couldn't have been another. There couldn't have been a, a Yosha who uh, was misnamed Jesus. Couldn't have existed. All of these things had to be fulfilled and happen through do oh, David. And then you're dealing with the 22nd and 88th Mismor. They're written in first person about actually fulfilling these events. And then you start reading more about the Psalms. And all of a sudden then, you, you stumble upon things like Yahshua 11, which speaks of Yahweh's full court press. All seven of the Ruach empowering a single individual who is called a choder. Well, Dode is the, the Shemak branch. The choder is a stem off that branch. And that He's going to write something that Yahweh himself is going to lift up in the last days to call his people home. And then you, you, you turn to the other place where Zeroah is screaming out of the pages, and it happens to be Dode's son. At the point that the covenant home has been built, and he's giving the first Sermon on the Mountain, the commencement speech, and he speaks about Anakra. And this Anakra is God's observant foreigner who is going to bring this message home that that Solomon says you need to listen to him Israel because while he is of a different ethnicity than you he's the one who is empowered to awaken you and bring you home and over and over again we read this and it's no longer anonymous no. and you say so God, why are you doing this? It was so much more fun being anonymous. No responsibility, all opportunity. Yeah. And now you've got all these if prophecies, really hundreds anonymous. of them, about what we're doing. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. You didn't tell me that when we, when I signed up. <laughs> Not so anonymous. You might anonymous. have given me a hand. Oh, yeah. Small press. What are you doing? <laughs> and then you realize... That what he was doing is that he was going to have his seven spirits through being observant of his word have this numbskull find the single most important discoveries of the last 3,000 years and share them openly with God's people. Yep. That he was going to awaken this man to know that Dode is our Savior. That he fulfilled Pesach, Matzah, and Bakudim leading to Shavua. So we could Teruah about it. And therefore, Yisrael would be taken by surprise. And they wouldn't miss the ultimate family reunion. And they will be there on October 7th, 2nd, at 6.22 p.m. in Jerusalem, when Yahweh returns with Dod. And to make that celebration extra special, now we know what Zachariah meant when he said, that we will look up to the one who is accompanying him and cry as one would cry for a firstborn son, recognizing not only what he did, but what his people did to him to negate it. That is your That's story, such a beautiful Israel. point. Yeah. This is beautiful the story point. that Israel has missed. This is where the rabbis have so failed them mm -hmm. and misled them. It's where their politicians have failed them and misled them. It's where the world has gone wrong. 
And this is why God decided that he would reference this herald, this Nakri, this Choder, this Bashar, hundreds of times. Because he wanted his people to be without excuse. He wanted them to know why he was communicating to them through him. I was translating today for the, it was yesterday, the days flow one to one another, um, a passage that I had never fully appreciated, but my uh, maybe my favorite Torah section now is Dabati Meitin. And Dabati Meitin is, is uh, Moshe um, telling Yisrael, all who will listen, that when Dode comes, that Dode is the prophet that is like him that will come, that you need to pay a special close attention to what he says, that God's words will be in his mouth. And that if you don't pay attention to what he had to say, then uh, God's going to reject you as a result. It's exceedingly powerful about it. And what it says is really interesting, too, that is, pertains to what we're doing here. God explains in that conversation through, uh, through Moshe that, you know, I, I, I want you to remember, Israel, when you said, I don't want to ever hear his voice again, God's. Mm-hmm. And God said, that's as it should be. I have no problem with that. And I've always wondered, why would God say that? And it, it, it finally dawned on me. The children of Israel were irascible. That's a nice way to say they were miserable. Mm -hmm. They were just flat out nasty. I mean, I can't imagine a more unappreciative, whiny group of malcontents than the children of Israel on the on the Yatza Exodus. They're obnoxious, and so. God had arranged this meeting because he wanted Israel to be without excuse, to know for certain that he was responsible, the creator God of the universe was responsible for the Torah, and that he was the inspiration behind Moshe. And so God said, gather them all together. I'm going to speak to them in first person in their presence, to demonstrate my support for you and that I am, in fact, speaking through you to them. And it turned out exactly as God expected and wanted. What did the Israelites do? (laughs) We don't want to hear him anymore. Oh, no. Can't stand that bright light. Can't stand that voice. Moshe, never again. (laughs) God said, thank you very much. Now I get to do it my way. Wow. What's my way? My way is I pick somebody that I like. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it could be for a host of different reasons. God exp- explained on Dode. The people pick Shaul. Yahweh said, no, I'm picking Dode, this eight-year-old kid here. I love him. And the reasons I have chosen him are completely different than the reason that, that men choose who they choose. And he picked Moshe. And so you realize that what God likes is to work with people that have a set of characteristics, of of attributes, a certain type of character that he likes to work through. And that he much prefers to have his message filtered through these individuals. Dabariam is such a great example. It's so brilliant. It's so beautifully written. It's so insightful. And yet it's Moshe speaking to us, inspired by Yahweh. These Mizmor are riveting. They're brilliant. It's Yahweh inspiring Dode to speak through us, or through him to us. This is what God likes. So with the children of of, uh, Israel, who were jerks, 
saying, don't ever do that again. God said, hey, yep, that's what I wanted. Now I get to continue to inspire a man I respect, Moshe. And who is not to love Moshe? What a great man of character. Now, so, yeah, well, got what he wanted. And from that point on, that's what he did. There were occasions where there were two or three people. You know, Abraham and, and Sarah was an example of uh, more than, uh, than one. At the time of uh, Yashaya, there were several uh, prophets who overlapped one another. And so there are times where he'll pick more than one person, but for the most part, one at a time. And as Dode explained, as Gabrielle, uh, to Daniel uh, in the 7th century BCE, that uh, there would be no more prophets. going to put an end to prophecy. There's no reason to have any more prophets. God said he was going to do. He did it. Mm-hmm. And now all that is left is to is to live through Imagine. the time of Jacob's troubles and mm-hmm. to Yahweh's return with Dod, all of which had been previously prophesied. So this is God's approach. The only thing that is different in uh, my case, and it's not a whole lot different because we learned a lot through Yahweh's uh, relationship uh, with uh, Adam and Chawa. They weren't Jews. We learned a lot through Yahweh's relationship with Noah and his kids. They weren't Jews. Mm-hmm. We learned all about the covenant through Yahweh's relationship with Abraham and Sarah. They weren't Jews. We learned more from a very troubled and, and but yet still loving relationship with Yishak and with Jacob, yep. mm-hmm. and even a great deal from Leah. They weren't Jews. First Jew was uh, Jacob's uh, son, uh, uh, Yahud. Yeah, Yahud. And his sons were the first Israelites. Mm-hmm. So it's not uncommon for God, obviously. In the beginning, all of his communication was uh, through these uh, people. And by the way, God said that Abraham was even a prophet. So uh, uh, it is possible that uh, God's going to uh, to conclude as he began. It's always how Yahweh does things. We're headed back to the garden that we were booted out of uh, nearly 6,000 years ago. So this time it's a goy speaking to Jews. Well, part of that is because uh, Jews forfeited the job. There were none. They that, weren't. Right. That were willing to accept Yahweh by name, that were willing to walk away from religion and politics, that were willing to go where his words lead, that were I mean, willing to devote the time. Now, this is the most fun job in the world, but it is... 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week. And it has been so for most of the past almost 23 years. Hmm. Uh, So that is where we are, and that is what we're doing. And the purpose is that there is a spiritual battle underfoot. Uh, The uh, spiritual battle is between Hasatan, uh, and uh, and Dode. Uh okay. Yahweh is a non-participant in this battle. He uh, he did negate Hasatan. Hasatan was once a karub, uh, which is a, a cherub, um, guarding the walls of uh, the Garden of Eden. And he uh, uh, was the first to misappropriate and misconstrue Yahweh's testimony to deceive Chawa and, uh, and Adam. And for having done so, uh, he was degraded to the capacity of a snake, which is why the first book of goddamn religion is named Stake in the Desert, and the second is Satanic. Uh, so he has very little capacity. You ought not ever be afraid of uh, Satan. He is a snake. He can't do anything <clears throat> on his own. Right. All he can do is inspire people to do his bidding. That's why Islamic jihadists are so murderous. <clears throat> they created a death cult. Uh, Allah is committed to waging war against all humankind. 
He wants all humans either enslaved to him, submission Islam, or dead. And, and because of that, it's the ultimate showdown. <clears throat> because you have this religion that says a genocidal rage against Jews and it has for 1,400 years. They want to wipe Jews out to the last. Well, if there are no more Jews, there can be no day of reconciliation. There can be no return or family reunion on that day. So Satan's end game is to annihilate Jews. That's why Islam annihilates Jews. It's why Christianity was such an anti-Semitic religion. Mm -hmm. Is that Satan and he demon-possessed by their own admission, both Muhammad and Paul. Satan must negate Jews. He must eliminate them or he must come up with religions like Judaism or Christianity and Islam uh, that mm -hmm. preclude them, even now progressive thought, uh, I shouldn't say progressive thought, progressive idiocy, that blind people to the truth. <clears throat> because it's not just a remnant of Jews that must exist and in, in, in a goodly number, you know, I think at least 70,000 that are there on Yom Kippurim for Yahweh and Dod's return, every single one of those who is there has to know Yahweh's name, love Yahweh's name, know that Dod is our Savior, understand the value of the Moed Mekre, uh, have replied to Yahweh's uh, invitation to attend the Moed Mekre. They will be there on the Moed of, of Yom Kippurim, and they will have accepted the terms of the covenant. Every single one of them. Well, there is no one on earth other than what we have been inspired to do by studying the prophets who is sharing the message that is necessary to be there. No one else is celebrating Yahweh's name. No one else is talking about the five terms and conditions of the covenant. No one else is speaking of the Moed Mikre as the means to return to Yah and enter heaven. No one else is speaking of Dode's fulfillment of them or of Dode's return or telling you when these things are going to happen. All of which are happening here for the first time, along with volumes explaining the false nature of the adversary through Islam, goddamn religion, the false nature of the adversary through Christianity, the four volumes of questioning Paul. The false nature of your rabbinic Judaism and how it misleads Jews. Why God, why Dod is so angry at the religious in Israel today. That's the Babel series, three volumes. While at the same time sharing the nature of the covenant and Yahweh's um, plan of salvation through the Moed Mikre. This is the one place in the world you can get that. And it's all free. You know, because of this marvelous website that uh, David has created for us under yadayad.com and, and D, you've contributed to, Leah, my wife has contributed to, Jackie has contributed marvelously to it. And, and, and so to share this message, so has Steve and Mike and uh, JK mm -hmm. and, uh, and so many others. That. Yeah. Because of what the Covenant family have come to do and this message, everyone in the world can read it for free. All of these books, all of these programs are archived there. And they're free. And even if you prefer the paperback books, which I happen to uh, love, you know, a 800-page book is like 12 bucks delivered at Amazon. And they're royalty-free. That's just the cost to print them and deliver them. You know, I don't out own Amazon, so I can't give them as a gift. But what a what a value! That's a deal. Yeah. Of a lifetime. For sure. Yeah, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. And what we want is more people, and particularly in Israel, buying them and reading them with a group of people publicly, drawing attention to what's there. So that as many Yehudim as is possible are there nine and a half years from now. 
And it's highly likely that within oh, five and a half years, the covenant family is going to be gone. That's the mm -hmm. Teruah harvest. And so you're going to have a period of time where it's, it's uh, you're going to really need to rely on, on this sign, as Yahweh speaks of it, a nesh that has been uh, left behind for you to read. It's always a written record. Yeah. Yeah. So as is the case with the one true God positioned against thousands of imposters, you know, so it is with Yara Yahweh standing alone, one voice against billions. God has never been popular. He seldom worked through many, preferring to handpick his prophets and his messengers. To deny what Yahweh, father and son, Dode, accomplished through Chag Matzah, which is in companies Pesach, Matzah, and Bakurim, and what they will achieve together on Kampurim, leading to Sukkah in year 6000 Yah, rightfully engenders their angst and disgust because of, of what religious Jews have done to discredit it and to preclude Yahweh's people from capitalizing upon it. So we're in opposition to rabbinic Judaism. We're in opposition to Christianity. We're in opposition to progressives. We are opposed to Muslims. We are for Yisrael and Yehudim because we love Yahweh and his son, Dod. Right. You know, from the first word of the first Mizmor to the concluding phrase of the second Mizmor Psalm, we are connected through Ashri, the first person expression of all Asher represents. And for those engaging in a relationship with Father through the Son, Dehot has a way with words. No matter if you prefer to render Nashak as kiss or reach out and touch as a sign of affection or even brush up against, each requires the physical presence of the affor aforementioned Masayak the anointed Messiah, the Malak, the king, who is Bar, the favored son, who brilliantly perfects those of us through the covenant with an inheritance. It is becoming increasingly difficult to overlook the obvious. We are witnessing the second and the third coming of the Son of God, of the Messiah, the king of Yisrael, God, David, the beloved of Yahweh. With father and son, it's all about understanding and accepting Dode's role as the Pesach Gael, the Passover lamb. Along with his soul, his nefesh, fulfillment of matzah and bakurim. And this is because there is no other way to extend our lives, to perfect our souls, or to be part of the covenant family. Since Dode is going to be king of the millennial kingdom, mm -hmm. and that's a thousand years, it's a really bad idea to annoy him. To deny him now is to forego living with him then. Don't do so. But it's not just that annoying him as our king, as our shepherd, as our savior, is a really foolish idea. His father is God. God loves his son. To cheat his son out of what he has accomplished for us is very irritating to God. And as bad an idea as it is to upset Dote by all of this, it is far, far worse on, uh, on God. That's the nature of a loving father. It has been an amazing journey, one that has comprised of one comprised of ideas and words. It's taken us from the worst of man to the best of father and son. So here's a recap of the well, what I would have said was the greatest song ever written. That's really not fair, because I think the greatest song 
ever written is the 89th Mismore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it is, it's an old song. But this one's a good one. <clears throat> For what reason, one should ask, do noisy and confused throngs of scheming and rebellious Gentiles gather together to conspire in open defiance? The people of these nations who are transformed while massing under an antiquated and unifying religious, political, and conspiratorial leader choose to plot and to speak after selectively searching, muttering their musings aloud, along with their imagined grievances and personal beliefs, all in vain, deluded in their fantasies while promoting worthless myths. Ms. Moore, 2-1. That's the world. Look at it. Muslims, Christians, even Herodim. And you may say, well, Herodim are Jews. They're, they're not Goyim. Oh, there are times when, yeah, well, we'll use Goyim to describe Jews. It says the Jews are, are just, so religious, so political, so estranged from him, they might as well be Goyim. <laughs> and there are Goyim that are so in love with Dode and with Yahweh and with the covenant and the Torah and prophets that he refers to them as Yehudim. Yay. So this is... God's Dode is speaking of what we're witnessing today amongst progressives, amongst Muslims, amongst Christians, amongst conspiratorialists, all in this furor and all wrapped up in their opinions, all scheming, all rebellious, for nothing. The rulers of the earth are just, he says, are solely on their own initiative, continually setting themselves up. Those in command claiming primacy of authority and esteemed status are laying a foundation to conspire and rebel all together over Yahweh and against his anointed Messiah. Well, Muhammad claimed to be the Messiah. The Christian Jesus is claimed to be the Messiah. Well, those are absolute lies against the real Messiah. The ultimate plot against Dode is fundamentalist Judaism with its false Messiah, Bar Kokhba, an unknown Messiah returning. Christianity with its false Messiah and Islam with theirs. Everyone is conspiring against Yahweh's Messiah. It's Dode. Mm -hmm. And Dode wants you to know, indeed, he is the Messiah. He is the anointed of Yah. Let us choose, he says, of our own volition, to break and pull off the bonds which trap and ensnare. What is religion based on? Religion. Religion. It's a uh, mm-hmm. it's a Latin word, mm-hmm. and it's the same Latin word that we get uh, a ligament. Mm-hmm. And uh, a ligament is that which binds our bones together. So religion means to rebind, to refetter, to recontrol people. And so rulers, he said are clamoring to authorize themselves, to elevate their status. They're setting the foundations to conspire and rebel over Yahweh and his Messiah. I don't have a president. Right. I don't have a lord. No. I don't have a governor. I have a king. And I will... Do the bidding of my king. I will herald my king's arrival. And the only reason is, is because this one king, unlike any other king, has earned my respect. Had it not been for him, I wouldn't be alive. So I am offering him the very thing 
that he made possible my life. My my life is over without him. So is yours. Same. Yeah. What isn't much to offer our Savior, our life? Let us choose of our own volition to break free and pull off those bonds, rejecting them. Stay away from religion. Stay away from politics. He who inhabits, establishing his dwelling place in the heaven, holds them in contempt, and he's going to pulverize them. Yahweh ridicules their foreign behavior and mocks their unfamiliar language. No, all those people that think that they're doing a service to their God, Yahweh is laughing at and will soon pulverize. Mm -hmm. and how could God do anything else but laugh at it? I told you, if you read goddamn religion, you're going to laugh. It's funny. There's lots of snark. For the same reason that God is. It's so stupid, you have to mock it. And that's exactly what... Yeah, I was doing. He just said, you know, you're just so stupid. that <laughs> Really, the best medicine is to laugh at you. Oh, by the way, though, I'm not going to laugh all that much longer because I will pulverize you. Mm -hmm. Then he will communicate expressing himself towards them, showing his frustration and resentment. And in his burning indignation, he will overwhelm and belinder, uh, bewilder them. God is putting on us on notice. If you want to continue to be religious and political, then you are antagonizing God and that when he returns and brings us back into the Garden of Eden, there will be no religion or politics allowed. Right. So you're signing your own death certificate to continue to be religious. So yes, God is irritated. Yes, he resents what they have done to him and to his son. But he has every right to be. And there is no way he can accommodate them because then heaven would be just like hell. Mm -hmm. No different than what we're experiencing on earth now. So he has to eliminate them. But it's the only right and righteous thing to do is to yeah. el eliminate all those who have lied about him and lied about his son. Yep. And you can't claim unfair because he's given you every warning. These words are not difficult to understand. I myself have offered leadership, Dode said, providing counsel through my governance upon Zion, the signs posted along the way, my set-apart mountain. This is Dode speaking to us in first person. Mm -hmm. And when he says this, where must Zion be? On the Mount. Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. It has to be on Mount Moriah. That is where Dode offered leadership and governance. That yes. is where Dode made the sacrifice of Pesach. That's yes. where he left to make and returned to fulfill Matzah. It is the city of Dode. It is his set-apart mountain, just as it is Yahweh's, just as it is ours. That's the beauty of being part of the covenant family. It's ours too. So are those signs. They have our names on them, just as they have Dode's name. Dode's name's just a little higher on the chart. I will choose to account for proclaiming and writing the prescription for living that cuts us into the relationship with the Almighty, which Yahweh said of me, You are my son. This day I bring you forth as your father. Go back a thousand years before this was spoken. Three, for us now, you would need to go back 4,000 years on this exact same set-apart mountain. There was a father and son who walked up it mm -hmm. on Pesach. Yishak. Yep, Abraham and Yishak. And... Yahweh said that he would provide the lamb. And he said, do not take the life of your one and only son, your son whom you love. 
because I will provide the lamb. And so Yahweh saying, on this day, I am announcing, you are my son. I am bringing you forth as your father. I am bringing you not only to fulfill Pesach as the Passover lamb, but also returning to bring you forth to fulfill Yom Kippurim, the day of reconciliation, to which Dode, as the first order of business, will anoint the mercy seat, the Kippurim of the Ark of the Covenant, fulfilling the Torah's prescription for this day. Powerful. God is enabling all of this. And for anyone who would say, you know, how could a loving father, this was my thing for years, how could a loving father sacrifice his own son? He wouldn't allow Abraham to do it, and yet God is sacrificing his own son as the Passover lamb. Because all it took was his son's body. Because his son wanted it to happen that way. Because his son volunteered. Because it was the right thing to do. And then his soul lived on to carry our guilt with him into Sheol. Deposited there, never to be seen again. And then Yahweh was in a position to make Dode his firstborn son on Bakudim firstborn children, empowering and enriching him as a result in us through this process. That is what Father and Son are announcing. And all we have to do is accept it, appreciate it, acknowledge them for it, say their names, acknowledge who they are, what they have done. When they invite you to attend seven Moed Mikra each year, attend them. When they invite you into the covenant, accept the conditions. When God says, I'm expecting you to read what he wrote, I'm going to hold you to it. Read the Mizmor. Read what Samuel wrote about him. Read the Mashal Proverbs. The most joyful thing you could possibly do. Feel free to ask questions about this, seeking to learn the answers because literally out of me and from me, there will be an inherited share of the land of the Gentile nations that will be given to you and unto successive generations, even unto the distant reaches of the earth, perhaps even the material realm, becoming your property. Pesach, Kippurim. Your 4,000 yah, your 6,000 yah. Mismor 2.8 is about year 6,000 yah on Kippurim. Mismor 2.7 is about Pesach in your 4,000 Yah. Same man, same soul, same God. Same set of Mikre. Just Chag Matzah in the first, and Yom Kippurim and Sukkah on the second. You shall break up their evil nature and shatter their mistaken ways with an iron staff and scepter as if they were a potter's vessel, as a means to contain and control, and then you will shatter and separate them. The religion, the evil of religion and politics and conspiracy, has to be scrubbed from the earth mm-hmm. for two things to happen. For, for Yahweh to return the earth to the conditions experienced in the Garden of Eden, there can be no religion, no politics, no conspiracy. We're living our lives in the best possible circumstances, up close and personal, with our Father and His Son. So He has to cleanse the earth of the most deadly pathogen to ever infect it, religion and politics. And 
The second uh, reason for all this is for fairness, for accountability. If God simply overlooked all of the Muslims and Christians and progressives that have sought to harm his people, and say, ah, no big deal, you know, so you made a mistake, we'll, we'll overlook it, and uh, you just your soul dissipates to nothing, that's no judgment. Well, then he would cease to be fair. He would cease to be a good father. Because a good father is going to provide closure for the children that they have attacked and harmed and give the victims of Islam, of Christianity, and now progressives the opportunity to see that those who deliberately and knowingly harmed them are going to be held accountable. Mm-hmm. And those are the reasons that these are things are going to happen. And it is a here here. It's the right thing for God to do. Well, that's it. Yep. The United States doesn't kill all the fake Estonians by dropping food on them. <laughs> therefore, therefore, now, political and religious leaders, military and government officials, choose to be prudent and circumspect and elect to heed this warning, making the rational decision and heed this warning, making the rational decision to support the land. God is saying, you know, it's the right call. Um, you can be a nincompoop like Biden, uh, like Putin, like Z, uh, like Marcion, like so many of the world leaders. Uh, mm-hmm. A nameless president of South Africa and Brazil, all all the Muslims, and and you can condemn Israel to your heart's content. God says it's a really bad idea. If you want to live, you want to have a chance. If you don't want me to judge you, if you don't want to go to Sheol for all eternity, don't do that. Right. This is God's warning to you. With reverence and respect, work with and serve alongside Yahweh. And rejoice to the point of quivering. That's the other side of the question. So, at the very least, stop attacking and harming my people. That'll keep you out of Sheol. And if you'd like to go to heaven, well, let's develop a relationship. Mm-hmm. And if you want to do that, then I would expect you to abide. You want to work and serve together. Because once you know what God is offering, you'll want to share it. You want to know more about it. You want to bring it to other people's attention. That's the reason, uh, Kirk and Dee, you you work so hard at this. Mm -hmm. Is once we know the truth, we want to share the truth. Reach out and touch. Rub up against. Contacting is a sign of affection. Demonstrating your mutual adoration for the relationship. Demonstrating your affinity. For the radiant and favorite sun, the brilliant and purifying air, the bar. Lest he is perceived as indignant and is displeased and you perish in this way. For indeed, his righteous indignation can be kindled for a few and for very little, comparatively. And that's the way it should be. Joyful with me and blessed by me are all who put their trust in him. Ms. Moore, uh, 2.12. Uh, is, uh, <laughs> yes, there are uh, more powerful Ms. Moore. Um, the 89th comes to mind, but uh, that's about as good as they get. Uh-huh. Yeah. So yeah. the second Ms. Moore song is Prophetic of Dode, just as uh, as we had thought, but in a much more profound and earth-shattering way than we probably perceived before we uh, dove into it. It predicted the second and third manifestations of the Messiah and Son of God. Well, this next Mismor, the third, affirms his prior arrival and his return as uh, would Yermia 9, Yashaya 9, and Zachariah 12, all that fit together. Citations that we have and will again consider as we seek to understand Yahweh's statement regarding bringing his son forth on this day. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, though. Just 
for a moment. I am mm-hmm. announcing I am bringing my son forth on this day. Well, Dode was not Yahweh's son when he anointed him Messiah. He was an uh, eight-year-old boy, and we were told uh, you know, all about his father, who was kind of a creep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, eh? And, uh, yeah. and so Yahweh didn't claim him as a son until later on. And so for God to say, I'm bringing him forth as my son on this day, well, there has to be a day certain that he is bringing forth his son. Mm -hmm. And the most logical pick would be to go back to what happened in year 2000, yeah, with Abraham and Yishak on Mount Moriah and that whole discussion of father and son and providing the lamb. Mm. And since Yahweh's return is to reconcile the covenant relationship with his father, that's what Jeremiah 31 is all about, of, uh, of reaffirming the covenant relationship, who better to do it with than his firstborn son, Dod? So we have to keep that in mind as we enter the third Mizmor, uh, that Dode is symbolic of the interaction of mankind with the Torah. Now, we are still recording here for Yada Yah. We're no longer broadcasting. Our 90 minutes is over. We're in the 30-minute buffer where we get to be a, a bit more exuberant about Yahweh's testimony. So we're going to uh, go into a little bit of the, the third Mizmor here. Uh, for those who have been reading along and, uh, and uh, coming home one, uh, You'll know that I skipped about uh, 30 pages of material. And mm-hmm. the pages that I skipped was a, a letter that was written by a, a Christian uh, conspiratorialist who was an anti-Semite who murdered Jews and was justifying his murder of Jews through all manner of, of moronic conspiracies. And the reason I skipped it is that I wanted to hear from Dode, not that numbskull. Yes. And um, yes. while I'm not complaining, I am spending 12 to 14 hours a day uh, <laughs> mushing my way through hell uh, in the goddamn religion's presentation of the Islamic Hadith and Quran. And I thought in, uh, as we celebrate the Shabbat that I would not add insult to injury. So... Uh, uh, that is the uh, the reason for that, if you're wondering. So, Dode is is representative of the covenant family. He's also representative of Yisrael. He is Yisrael, the good and the bad, living his life, expressing himself, such that we are able to understand and capitalize upon his sacrifice as the Pesach lamb. And yet. He is very real. He's one of us. He's a man challenged in all the ways we have experienced and more. His family was like our family, and thus like God's family. That said, we have no way of knowing whether the third Mismor was actually dedicated as the Masoretic text introduction reads today. Not only isn't there any reference to Absalom in the psalm, the coup that led against the coup that he led against his father uh, is not mentioned in the psalm as well, nor the father mourning over the death of his son, since this uprising occurred at the end of Dode's reign, when he was uh, but a whisper of his former vitality. So its placement in this early Mismore, in the flow of the Mismore seems somewhat incongruous with the, the life that Dode left and the timing of that life. Nevertheless, there is a great deal we can learn by considering this rather deplorable incident in Israel's history. So I think it is wise to present the Masoretic, Masoretic text and the prelude to this Mizmor and then explain the episode which led through it, whether or not mm-hmm. It was uh, it was intended. It was intended. It was prophetic. It begins a mizmor, 
If you want to know why I called the Psalms Mismore, well, I figured that if I used the same term that Dode used, that I really couldn't be wrong. Uh, it's, it's a pretty safe observation on my part, I think. <laughs> no one, no one called me stupid so far today. A oh, Mismore song, uh, which is mel melodious music uh, accompanied by lyrics of Dode, the beloved, D W D. To be loved, to be adored. Upon his fleeing from the presence of Absalom. Absalom means uh, reconciling father. And then it, it's the introduction concludes with his son. So a Mismore song of Dode. Upon his fleeing from the presence of Absalom, his son. The episode, the Masoretic text introduction, references was symbolic of the broken family of man. Dode's household was torn apart in the worst possible way. Just has been the case with Yisrael violating every aspect of the covenant over time. And it is all reflected in the fallen state of the familial relationships that father and son sought to rectify during Chag Matzah and will resolve again on Yom Kippurim, the Day of Reconciliations. So there is some uh, meat to this message. So let's take a moment and consider what happened uh, circa 1000 BCE. Absalom, which name means the father who reconciles, uh, and he, his father did in fact reconcile, uh, was the third of six sons born to, born to Dode at Hebra. Uh, Absalom's mother was Ma'ak, uh, the third of four wives uh, chosen by Dod in this same place. His wife Ma'ak was the daughter of Talmai, who was the king of uh, Geshur. Regrettably, Dod's daughter Tamar, who was Absalom's sister, was raped by Amnon, uh, which was Dod's firstborn son. For reasons we may never know, Dode did not intervene. He did not hold his son accountable. With this evil unchecked, Tamar sought revenge through Absalom. They were brother and sister. As their rage over what had occurred welled up within them, after two years' time, Absalom sought to avenge his sister's rape, sending his servants to murder a drunken Amnon. That was during a feast. And they mm -hmm. killed Dode's wayward firstborn son. For what he had done, actually. Immediately yes. thereafter, Absalom fled to his maternal grandfather, the aforementioned king of Geshur. Now, that's a pretty brutal way to uh, to share a family life. That wasn't much fun around the old Pesach table. Three years later, Dode erred again, and he forgave his son Absalom for killing his firstborn son. And so he returned to Jerusalem. And there Absalom uh, flattered and appeased everyone, saying, if only I were the Shaphat judge of the land, you would have everything you wanted. And he was thereby appealing to the selfish nature of many. After four years of being subversive and duplicitous, Absalom declared himself king. He even slept with his father's concubines. Mm. Having played the role of a modern politician to perfection, and by offering the people what was not theirs to take or his to give, many flocked to him, leaving Dode somewhat vulnerable and isolated. Upon hearing the coup and subsequently infiltrating his son's court, Dode took his time committing his troops to battle. But finally, he had his nephew, Yoab, his most valiant commander, confront his son, and the usurpers aligned with him in the woods of Ephraim, 
and there they would rout Absalom. During the battle, as Dode's overtly ambitious son retreated, riding an ass, a pered, meaning to break apart and separate, Absalom's hair was caught by, uh, by Allah, Gadol Allah, glorified Allah, a mighty oak tree in Hebrew. His predicament was reported to Joab, Dode's commander, whom Absalom had previously insulted and sought to intimidate by setting his fields ablaze. Upon seeing him hanging in the tree, Joab killed him. He killed Absalom with three darts to the heart, even though Dode had given explicit instructions that no one was to harm his son. There are times when death is the appropriate thing to do. If I had been in Petra or Yathrib, when Muhammad was making a fool of himself and then declared war on all humankind to protect the two billion souls that he would infect and the hundreds of millions of lives that he would snuff out, I would have taken his life. Mm -hmm. And if you go forward in time and you're dealing with with uh, Adolf Hitler or Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, Given the opportunity, I would absolutely take either of their lives mm -hmm. to prevent the untold misery that they would impose on innocent people. Well, Absalom was a traitor to the man that Yahweh himself had anointed to be king of Israel. He was a traitor to his father. He was a self-serving brat. And while brats don't deserve to be murdered, someone who challenges Yahweh's anointed king over his people and Amen. does these kinds of things, that is the appropriate response. Yoab was right. Upon this news of death, however, Dode went up to the second story room over the doorway and he wept. As uh, he walked about and carried on like this, O oh, my son, Absalom, if I could, I would have given my life for you. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Oh, haunting words. Mm. O oh, Absalom, my son, if I could, I would have given my life for you. I say those are haunting words. Because mm -hmm. Dode was in, a, uh, in an exceedingly negotiable position. He was volunteering to fulfill Pesach and Matzah. He was the only person in human history qualified to do so. God needed him to fulfill Pesach and Matzah. And so Dode was in a position to negotiate. And at that point, you know, God's not being inappropriate to negotiate with Dode. Dode is doing something marvelous. The man asked for a favor. You think God's going to turn him down? Yeah, I know. Oh, my son, Absalom, if I could, I would give my life for you. This serves, in my opinion, my conclusion, to foreshadow Dode's offering his life on Passover in his soul during matzah, as Absalom, the father's reconciliation. Now, you don't have to agree with me. It's, uh, this is, is something that, uh, that I'm reading into this because I love Dode. I think I've come to understand Dode, understand what he was willing to do. And I think as a result of that, it was appropriate for Yahweh to provide every possible motivation for Dode to realize that what he had done would, would serve the many people in ways that he had hoped. So the moment I came to realize why Dode volunteered to serve as the Passover lamb, and is a lot more than Absalom. Dode did a lot of things that were wonderful and did a lot of things that weren't so wonderful, and, and God is asking him to come back and be king of eternity, <clears throat> and he had enough times being king for 40 years in Israel, uh, he, he had to know that it's going to take something extraordinary to 
to be able to rule over Yehudim. And and so this was the answer. You know, so, to your point, when, when God allowed the 70,000 souls to die instead of running um, for his life, it, it makes sense he wasn't willing then, but for his own son, I could see it. I, I think it's a reasonable conclusion, a reasonable extrapolation. Yeah, it's uh, it's it speaks of the man who was equal parts cerebral and emotional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of of Yahweh's love for Dod as his son, and Dod's love for Absalom his son. Mm-hmm. So Dod was the embodiment of Israel, both good and bad, just like yeah. Absalom was the embodiment of Dod, both good and bad. Right, so anyway, it's my it's my theory. Um, it helps me understand how the man, why the man volunteered to uh, to perform this and how God rewarded his son for having done so. So it, if nothing else, it makes me feel good about it. And I think other people hearing this story, it might, causes them to at least think about, okay, I can see, you know, many fathers have laid down their lives for their sons mm-hmm. and for their yeah. daughters. It's relatable. It's relatable. Yeah. Yes, it no, is relatable. Sure. You know, it's not relatable. A man says, I'm going to take the sins and the guilt of every person who wants to be part of God's family, and I'm going to laden my soul with them and carry them into Sheol. I can't relate to that. I can explain it. I can talk about it. I can't relate to it. Yeah. I can relate. Uh, laying down my life to save my son. Yeah. I just think it's part of the story for uh, for that reason. So yes, Dode made this sacrifice to save Yisrael and everyone who would choose to be part of the covenant. And he made this sacrifice to earn his people's respect. Yes, he made this sacrifice because he loved Yahweh and knew that Yahweh needed this to be done. A lot but of I'm good reasons. He, yeah, mm-hmm. there's a lot of good reasons. And I'm also convinced that he did it to save his own soul and the soul of the son he loved. Yeah. Doe yeah. knew that he was partially responsible for the root cause of Absalom's rebellion. Mm-hmm. And he could make amends. And he would make amends. Mm-hmm. And it is demonstrative of a father's love for his son and the length he would go to reconcile his relationship with him, just as it is symbolic of how far Yahweh would go to reconcile his relationship with us. Yoab's speech to Dod that day is worth considering. Setting the scene, we read, the victory that day was turned to mourning for all of the people, for the family heard it, uh, said that the king was grieved for his son. The king covered his face and shrieked with a loud voice, O oh my son, Absalom, O oh my son, my son. Dode was inspired and blessed beyond any other man. And so he grieved for his son. And it is in this way that he represents the purpose of the word of God and the Torah which is to enlighten and perfect the imperfect. He also represents Yisrael, God's chosen and wayward children. But most of all, he represents the father who could now save his children. With Dod especially, when addressed by Yoab, Yahweh is also the father, such that we realize not only who we are, but what is possible when we align ourselves with the Father who became the Father's Son? So while the voice is Yoab, the inspiration behind every word of this is the Father for whom Yoab, Yah is the Father, was named. That's what Yoab means. Yahweh mm-hmm. is the Father. Then Yoab, Yah is the Father, arrived at the home of the king, and declared, you have become emaciated, withering away, confused and disappointing. 
this day in the presence of your co-workers and all who would have saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives, even the lives of your concubines, because you love those who you should hate and you hate those who you should love. Instead, you have implied this day that you don't have leaders or co-workers. I realize that if Absalom had lived and all of the rest of us had died this day, then it would have been seen by you as pleasing and correct. Wow. Best down. <laughs> I, I, uh, listen, either Yoab was inspired by God or God was speaking through Yoab. Mm -hmm. This is really brilliant. And this is Yahweh, I think, speaking to his most beloved son. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. I've said it a bunch of times that, you know, the thing that is marvelous about Dod is that he is not perfect, that he is really flawed. And what that means is that we can be like Dode with God. I don't think I'm as flawed as Dode. I don't think any of us are. And yet, okay. yeah, we'll love this man with the fullness of a father's love for a son, which says there's hope for us. Not just hope for us. There's ever a reason for us to Guaranteed. expect the same treatment. Yeah. Guaranteed. And keep in mind that with all of Dode's flaws... All God could see was the wondrous part of him because he realized in time that Dode would fulfill matzah and remove all of this guilt. The same thing he sees in us. But the key thing also to know is that Dode wore out. By the end of his life, he was an emaciated, withered, confused, and disappointed man who almost did more things wrong than right at the end of his life. Okay, it took a toll on him. Being the king of this group of irascible people was hard. And Moshe did it for 40 years, too. And it damn near killed him. Hmm. It's hard. Yeah. These are tough people. And Dode was just worn out. You know, he had fought... 66 battles, yeah, he'd won them all. But oh my God, how many times can you defend your people? And that's what happened at the end of his life. And I think this is a message for us that, that we ought not be that way. God is upset. So at this time in our lives, we have the opportunity to not follow that aspect of Dode's life to make our final years our most productive. Mm -hmm. And then to realize something that I, I think I broke new ground on. I, I don't think anyone had said this before, that hate is a virtue. That yeah. we can't learn to love until we learn who, when, why, and how to hate. We have to hate those who alter Yahweh's message and preclude millions and billions from salvation. We have to hate Muhammad and the creation of Islam and the Muslims that he inspired to massacre Jews. They deserve our hate. Paul. Paul yeah. deserves our title, hate. Hitler hate deserves our hate. Stalin deserves our hate. The rapist, the pedophile the person who is incestuous against his children, mm -hmm. the mass murderer. They need to be hated because if you don't hate them, you're not going to thwart them such that you can protect the innocent. So that's why this is so important. You need to know who to hate and who to love, why and how to hate and why and how to love. It is essential to being human, to being compassionate, to being courageous, to being just, 
Uh, this is such a, a powerful concept. So right now, stand up and choose to go out and speak from the heart to your coworkers. Because I promise by Yahweh, if you do not go forth, and if you remain an obstinate and a mobilized individual, this night will be worse for you than all of the evil that has befallen you from your youth to now. Wow. Stop <laughs> sulking. You know, uh, I was uh, once depressed. It lasted uh, several months. Uh, uh, it was uh, all, uh, I worked so hard with so many others to create this marvelous uh, company. And it was destroyed, and I found myself on a, on a cover story on a national periodical blamed for for the destroying the company when I hadn't even been there the last year. And I remember that my response was to be depressed over having lost something I loved and then having been smeared for it. And finally, the thing that, that ended that bout of depression was standing up and doing something worthwhile. Mm-hmm. I wrote my first book called In the Company. And it led to the 33 books that sit on the shelf now at Yada Yada. Um, that's what he's saying. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Stand up and speak. Do something worthwhile. The way that you resolve depression, the way that you resolve frustration and anxiety and anguish is to be devoted to doing something that is worthwhile for others. And if you can get out of yourself and make a contribution to others, your life is meaningful. That is what we do. It's why we write these books. It's why we do this program. That was his advice. We are now within seconds of Blog Talk Radio telling us good night so that they don't shush us up. I'm going to say on that note, have a wonderful evening. Look forward to covering the uh, either the third Mismore or going back to Yashaya 17 and 18 uh, next week at, uh, at this time. We'll make a a choice. I hope you won't be disappointed, but we'll do one or the other. Happy Shabbat. Uh, And we look forward to celebrating in a very short time now. Pesach with you uh, this year. May God bless you all. Good night, too. Good night. Good night, Dick. Good night, Kurt. Good night, Craig. Good night.